A lot's been going on lately with Bible translation in my neck of the woods. In this episode, I want to talk about my experience being a test pilot for some of the resources Cambridge Digital Bible Research has been developing for the Psalms and walk through a draft that I've been working on that's designed to guide translators step by step through the process of translating Hebrew poetry. This is Working for the Word, and I'm Andrew Case. Let's get started. As I mentioned, a while back, CDBR asked me to test out some of their materials and resources for preparing people to translate the first six psalms, because that's all they had at the moment developed. To start out, they gave me the visual presentations and scripts to translate into Spanish, which took a lot longer than I anticipated for various reasons. One of those reasons was that they hadn't been written specifically with translation in mind. So let me talk a little bit about that because I think it's important. When you write content for the world of Bible translation or to bless the global church, I strongly commend that you write it in such a way that it easily lends itself to translation into other languages so that it can bless more people. The optimal way to do this is to be bilingual so that you can anticipate many of the things that will make the translation of your material less of a headache for both people and for machines. Nowadays, it's often better to do a first draft translation with machine translation like Google Translate and then have a mother tongue speaker fine tune that translation. Saves a lot of time. The better that initial translation is, the less work the mother tongue speaker will have to do and the less time it will take to have a final product. So this streamlines the whole process and makes it much simpler to get your work into the hands of other people who don't speak English. So part of the discipline of writing with translation in mind is limiting your creativity and limiting how smart you sound in English or whatever your mother tongue is in what you're initially writing. This means that you're going to avoid more complex sentences and unusual vocabulary. You're going to try to avoid interesting idioms and metaphors and examples that relate only to your culture and not universally to all cultures. And you're going to avoid elevated jargon as much as possible. In other words, you're going to write like you're explaining something to a 10-year-old as much as possible. Now, I realize that that's not always possible, but as much as possible. And not everyone is able to do this automatically. It takes time and practice, and it's a skill I would encourage you to develop. The world of academia from which many translators herald typically fosters the opposite of this skill. It actively encourages scholars, usually by example, to write in such a way that sounds extra smart or even pretentious. The longer you're in that world and go with the flow, the more you begin to become fluent in academic ease if you're not careful to resist it. So while academic ease will impress some of the scholarly elite, it won't help the rest of the marginalized global church who needs your work translated or who speak English only as a second language. So I'd encourage us all to think about them first and forget about impressing the rich, ostentatious savants who prefer appealing only to their little bubble of other equally difficult to understand people. Now that sentence I just uttered is a perfect example of how not to write for translation. So that said, after working on the translation of the Psalms resources, I began a week-long workshop with the translators who represented two different teams who speak related dialects of Mistec. They're being funded by the seed company to do a translation of the Psalms for their languages over the next five years. The cost for this project is budgeted at about Seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars. Now, the language vitality of the groups has not been scientifically evaluated recently, which, for the record, I disagree with, and I've only agreed to help with the workshop on the condition that this will be done soon. Now, life happened, and only three translators showed up to the workshop, and one of them had such bad internet that he was hardly able to interact at all, since it was all via Zoom. The back translator for one of the projects had only just been recruited, was about to get married and didn't have any training in translation principles or back translations, nor did he have a firm handle on paratext yet. 
I had not been made aware of that when the project was proposed, so we did our best to work under the circumstances, but it was highly, highly not ideal. What I realized right away was that even though the CDBR resources helped the translators do a deep exegetical dive into each psalm, they still needed concrete steps by which to do the work of translation. After a week of the workshop, I had a better idea of their needs and weaknesses and decided to write a translation guide for them to work through. I'm going to read through that in a sec, but I want to make clear that I've already had a good debriefing with CDBR about their materials, and they've taken my many suggestions and are already improving their content accordingly. So I'm thankful for that, thankful for the opportunity to give them feedback. They're producing some amazing resources, and I'm really excited to see how they mature and develop in their presentation and their usefulness for Bible translators on the field. Now, another thing I did to test the translator's attention to detail was to create a two-column document of scripture for them to check for mistakes. I believe I mentioned this in a past podcast, but basically the idea was to have these two columns, one column that was the master column and one column that was full of different kinds of mistakes. So they had to go through the document and identify those mistakes. This gave me a much better idea of where they were at and their ability to identify really, really small mistakes and also larger mistakes. And then at the same time, it gave them a good exercise in seeing the kinds of things that I'm looking for them to be able to identify and catch and just some good practice. Now, some of the things I've seen in workshops on translating the Psalms or Hebrew poetry is a lot of talk about identifying different technical elements of poetry, like Here's a metaphor, and here's a simile, and here's a chiastic structure, etc. Then often they'll walk through an in-depth exegesis of a poem in the Psalms, and that supposedly is an example or a model for what they should do themselves. But rarely are very, very concrete, detailed steps given to the translators on how to use all of these things that they've learned and develop good habits and skills that will make them better translators of Hebrew poetry. So let's just walk through this draft that I've attempted to create for that purpose. I don't intend it to be the last or best or most refined example of this, but at least it's my first attempt. So I hope this is helpful for other people to think through and possibly some of these steps could be reordered. So step one, read the entire psalm aloud in the Reina Valera and the NVI, which is the Spanish version of the NIV. Number two, identify the parallels in each version. For example, let's look at Psalm 47.5 in both versions, and the parallelism is marked in bold. So we see that, and I won't read this in Spanish, but in the Reina Valera 1960, the parallelism is preserved in the translation. In the NIV, the parallelism is not preserved. Notice that the NIV chose, so this is in my notes here, the NIV chose to remove the parallelism that was in the original. Therefore, you must decide whether you want to preserve or remove parallelism in your language. When you compare these two translation decisions, you can begin to better understand the differences and make more informed decisions. It's always recommended to keep the parallelism if it sounds sweet or interesting in your language. Be sure to document whether or not you preserve the parallelism of each verse that contains it in the Reina Valera. This information is helpful to tell the consultant before they ask, along with clear reasons why you dropped or kept the parallelism. Number three, compare the Reina Valera and the NVI and highlight the places where they are very different. This should not include obvious differences, such as different spellings of names or synonymous words like iniquity and sin or waters and river. So A, find out why they are different. Label each difference as one of the following. Manuscript, so they are different because they followed different manuscripts or ancient versions. Hebrew idiom, 
they are different because one chose to render an idiomatic expression in Hebrew in modern Spanish and the other translated literally. Lexical, they're different because they understood the Hebrew word in different ways that are valid according to the lexicon or other. Sometimes there are other factors that create significant differences between translations. An example might be grammatical ambiguities that cause the versions to differ greatly. Many times the versions will differ in their temporal interpretation of the Hebrew verbs. That is, some will translate them as present and others as past. Side note here, this was a big discussion with CDBR that we had because I ran up against this again and again and again, because in Hebrew poetry, there is that ambiguity really often, especially with yiktol or the imperfect forms, whether to translate them as present or as future. And so the poor translator who may not be a Hebrew scholar is looking at all these different versions and they're jumping around between future and present and they don't know what to decide. And so they may just randomly decide, okay, here I'm going to translate future and here I'm going to translate present without any systematic understanding of why that's happening and what they need to do with it. So I encouraged CDBR to be really clear on that when they're guiding translators through the Psalms and help them understand, okay, why do we recommend to translate this as future or present, etc., and what are the arguments for that? So moving on with our steps. Number four, Mark keywords that are important to the psalm, words that you don't understand and words that may need more study. For example, in Psalm 1, you have the word ashre in Hebrew, which is translated as dichoso, feliz, or bienaventurado in Spanish, or in English, happy or blessed. So it's an important word that we need to understand in order to understand the message of the psalm. Another example Maybe you don't have a clear understanding of the word escarnecedores in Spanish, mockers, so you'll need to mark it. B, find each keyword you've marked in the Hebrew text and then look it up in the lexicon. Sometimes you will be able to locate the word directly or else you may need help from the Reina Valera Enhanced Resource. The best lexicon for the most detail is the one by Schokel, a lexicon that came out of Spain. Really, really excellent. C. Take notes on your work. If you discover something you need to remember later, write it down and keep it organized. If you learn something important about a keyword, use the key terms tool in Paratext to write notes and decisions you've made about the word. Number five, after you've studied all the words, phrases, and translation differences that you need to study in order to understand the poem, meditate on it and write down what you think the main message or purpose of the poem is. Mark some of the key verses in the poem that seem to be important to the author. For example, you could say that the main message of Psalm 2 is my king in Zion. This psalm is about earthly kings, the heavenly king, And the most important, God's king in Mount Zion, the place where heaven and earth meet. An important verse in the poem is verse 6. But I have put my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Step number six, identify poetic elements in the poem that you want to preserve. This could include things like the vivid imagery of Psalm 73, 9. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. In that last phrase, you can picture in your mind a bunch of tongues walking through the earth. This is an example of poetry that isn't immediately understood, but it captures your attention and forces you to think about it. It's more memorable. One version took away everything poetic in that phrase by translating it as follows. And I have an example here from a Spanish version that literally roughly translated is they try to guide the whole country. This is acceptable only as a last resort when you've exhausted all the creative resources of your language or have confirmed that it will be impossible for anyone to accept a more poetic rendering of the phrase, their tongues strut through the earth. Now, step seven Identify elements in the poem that reveal a different culture than your own. These poems were written thousands of years ago in a culture very different from your own. Keep that in mind 
as you seek to understand it and take notes on those cultural differences. For example, Psalm 2 speaks about kings, but most people groups no longer have kings. If you don't know much about kings in the ancient world around Israel, it would be wise to find an article in a biblical encyclopedia that tells you more about kings of the ancient Near East. Esword has some very good biblical encyclopedias in Spanish if you don't already have a printed version. A, another example, the Psalms were designed for use in the temple, which was very different from our modern churches. In the temple, they offered animal sacrifices, which we don't do today. These may be obvious, but you need to keep them in mind so that you don't make the mistake of imagining David as a pastor of a modern church writing poems about modern church issues. B, another example, the Psalms often use the word shield as a metaphor for God and his protection. If you don't have a word for that, you need to decide what to do, whether to translate it as protection or with a descriptive phrase or something else. Keep track of these decisions so that you can reference them later when you come to the same thing later on in the translation process so that you can be consistent. One way to do this will be with the key terms tool so you can quickly see what you've decided in the past and why. It's important to record the reason for your decision so that you can explain this to the consultant. When we translate poetry, there are a lot of good options for any given translation challenge, but we need to be able to show why the option we chose is the best one. We need to be able to show this to the consultant and to the language community when they ask. Step number eight, keep careful notes of your translation process. For each line of poetry or verse, document what version, commentary, or other resource influenced you the most in the translation of that line, phrase, or verse. For example, if the UBS translation handbook influenced your decision on a particular phrase, line, word, or verse, then just make a note of that that says UBS. You can write this note in brackets within the back translation, or you can keep a separate notebook where you write down the verse reference and the sources that influenced the way you ended up choosing to translate. Another example, if the NIV was the version that made most sense and was easiest to translate into your language on a certain verse, then just make a note that says NIV. Number nine. There are two problems you will need to solve on a regular basis. Number one, whether to translate Hebrew verbs in poetry as past, present, or future. This dilemma has plagued translators for centuries and is not an easy decision. If your language does not have an aspectual verbal system like Hebrew, you will probably be forced to make a decision on the temporal translation of these verbs. The versions will differ on this constantly. For example, in Psalm 2.2, the Reina Valera 1960 version translates the verb as future. Se levantarán los reyes de la tierra. The kings of the earth will rise up. But the NIV translates it as present. The kings of the earth rebel. Both versions translate the imperfect aspect of the root, yatsav, in this verse, and both are valid interpretations. Here are some suggestions on how to arrive at a solution. One simple solution could be to decide to use only one version, like the Reina Valera 1960, and stick to its translation decisions regarding the time of the Hebrew verbs. For example, if it translates something as present, then you do the same and consistently follow their decisions. This will avoid getting confused and mixing verb tenses by jumping back and forth between different versions. Once you decide on which version you will follow in verb decisions, document it and make sure to communicate your decision to the consultant. Now, if you decide against the above solution, you can use a hybrid solution. This would involve the work of studying the poem and deciding which kind of verb renderings make the most sense to your team and in your language. For example, it may be that in certain contexts, a future verb 
may sound better than a present verb in your language. If you choose this solution, you should be aware that it involves much more work and also carries the risk of failing to be consistent and breaking the internal logic or coherence of the poem. Once again, if you choose this option, document it and make sure to communicate your decision to the consultant. Now, the second problem you'll have to solve on a regular basis is how to divide the lines of poetry. Often there's a confusion between versions about where the lines of poetry should be divided. For example, in one verse, the Reina Valera 60 may have two lines and the NIV three lines. The best solution is to choose one version to follow regarding the division of the lines and stick to it. This will sometimes make your work more complicated because as you look at other versions for guidance on the translation, you may become confused or accidentally divide the lines in a different way from the translation you chose as your default model. So part of your process of checking the translation should be a line check where you look carefully at your draft and make sure the line divisions are consistently following the translation you chose as your guide. When you choose which translation you will use for this, make sure to document it and communicate your decision to the consultant. Step number 10. All the previous steps should have led you to develop a rough draft. At this step, you should carefully revise and polish the draft you have. Number 11. Now it's time to read your translation aloud three times. If the psalm is too long, break it into meaningful sections that you can use to work through the steps that follow. So here are the steps in that process. Number one, the first time, read it and work on becoming familiar with the sound of your translation. If you notice anything that needs to be smoothed out, smooth it out. Number two, the second and third times, Read it out dramatically with all the emotion that you think the psalm should carry. Number three, pay attention to how it sounds. Does it sound beautiful? Does it sound interesting? Remember that there is a delicate balance between naturalness and unnaturalness in poetry. In most languages, poetry does not sound natural because it is not the way people speak every day. Parentheses, this is a huge issue that has to be emphasized more in translation principles, in the training workshops that translators go to, and all of that, because I think most of them are coming out not understanding that poetry usually does not sound natural. End that parentheses. So when you read it aloud, it should sound like something extraordinary or even strange sometimes. Think of narrative like water and poetry like a tostada. Water is abundant and easy to swallow without chewing it, but a tostada takes time to chew and savor. However, a tostada has to have a balanced texture. It can't be as hard as a rock so that it breaks your teeth. That would be like poetry that can't be understood no matter how long you meditate on it. Obviously, there are parts of poems that are as easy to understand as drinking water, and that's okay, but we want to find the delicate balance where the poetry sounds good, but also makes people think more than narrative makes them think. Next, wait 30 to 60 minutes before you read the poem again. This will give your mind time to internalize what you've already read. If you need to wait until the next day, that's fine. The purpose is to let your brain have time to process everything in the background. Next, read the poem three more times with emotion. Make changes if you notice something that can be improved. When you make changes, document what kinds of changes you made and why. Next step, wait at least 15 to 30 minutes and then read it aloud twice to someone with emotion on the team or a volunteer who will listen and give you constructive feedback. So that's all for that draft. So I wrote it in such a way that made it very translatable. There are some things that you didn't hear in my reading of this English version that made it extra easy to translate into Spanish, things I'd anticipated that I smoothed out in this English reading of it. And so when I Google translated the document, I had a draft that was extremely useful 
and way more easy for me to fine tune into more natural Spanish. So I've given that document to the teams to work through and become more familiar with, and we will see how it pans out. If you want that document to translate into another language for your team, be my guest. I will link it in the description and you can use it however you want, revise it, change it, remix it, add to it, etc. Anyway, thank you so much for listening and for caring about Bible translation. This is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. Jesus.